On the Death of Branting the Revisionist by Yrjö Sirola Bourgeois socialism attains adequate expression when, and only when, it becomes a mere figure of speech. The Communist Manifesto The Communist Manifesto says that when the people saw feudal coats of arms on the backsides of certain so-called socialists, they ran away laughing loudly and disrespectfully. But in 1925 in Stockholm, a crowd of a hundred thousand workers walked behind the royal princess, who by escorting Hjalmar Branting to the grave, showed him their gratitude for successfully deceiving the workers. Not even the quote-unquote condolences of the high priests of capital with their fascist adjutants, as they were simultaneously planning a massive lockout against the same proletarians, got the workers to leave the procession, not laughing, but in disgust. Such a disgusting event could only take place under exceptional circumstances and also due to the special characteristic of men who, even when discussing a representative of the revolutionary working class movement, don't want to speak the truth about the dead, and so the real worth of their life's work is left covered by falsehoods. The social democrat, quote-unquote, citizen of the world, at whose beer on March 1st in the royal church the priests carried out the religious ceremonies, was one of the most dangerous traitors to socialism and the working class of our time. Hjalmar Branting was born 23rd of December, 1860. His father was a professor, his mother an aristocrat lady. The boy was educated in a school for the wealthy and went to university to study astronomy. In the 1880s he became infatuated with politics. It was the time of rising liberalism in Sweden. On the day he came of age, Branting donated a sum of money to the workers' school, which was under attack by some reactionary in the city council. As a journalist, he served a sentence of three and a half months for blasphemy. In 1886, he became the editor of Socialdemokraten and replaced the tailor Palme, who was spreading the new social democratic ideology in the country. He ended up in the leadership of the suffrage struggle, and in 1896 was elected to the Diet with liberal votes. The revolutionary rise of 1917 made him a finance minister in a coalition government. After that, he was prime minister in three social democrat governments, 1920 to 1921, 1922 to 1923, and 1924 to 1925. He was at the peak of his reputation in the autumn of 1924, when he was the chairman in a meeting of the Council of the League of Nations. He died on 24th of February, 1925. To be a leader of the workers' movement on four decades, and after your death, to get the respect and recognition of the whole capitalist world, that is something not everyone gets. To get that treatment, Ebert had to present himself as an open fascist, and help the Wilhelmian monarchists back in power, and Ole Leon, whose achievements the capitalists also recognize, was forced for a time to even present himself as a communist to best serve the interests of capitalism. But Branting did his service to capitalism without doing much violence against his quote-unquote ideology, like almost in unison, said the people writing his eulogies. But what was this so-called ideology that gave its representative such an excellent reputation? It is well known among us under the name democracy. Branting was its flag bearer already when it led the working masses to battle, and the vast Swedish working masses followed it even when, to use the words of a 70-year-old Engels, it had become the protecting anchor of reaction. Footnote. Quote, As to pure democracy and its role in the future, I do not share your opinion. Obviously, it plays a far more subordinate part in Germany than in countries with an older industrial development, but that does not prevent the possibility, when the moment of revolution comes, of its acquiring a temporary importance as the most radical bourgeois party, and as the final sheet anchor of the whole bourgeois and even feudal regime. At such a moment, the whole reactionary mass falls in behind it and strengthens it, Everything which used to be reactionary behaves as democratic. This has happened in every revolution. The tamest party still remaining in any way capable of government comes to power. 
In any case, our sole adversary on the day of the crisis and on the day after the crisis will be the whole collective reaction which will group itself around pure democracy. Unquote. Engels, letter to August Bebel, 11 to 12 December 1894. End of footnote. For Branting, democracy was always a lightning rod against class struggle. For the sake of it, he was in 1902, when he already was predicting a coalition government as a transition to socialism, ready to brave a three-day general strike. Quote-unquote, full democracy, he managed to gain from the ruling classes through the fear which the Russian and German revolutions evoked in them in 1917-1918 in the form of universal suffrage with the quote, necessary checks and balances, unquote, for which reason Sweden still has a pre-parliament and, of course, a monarchy. He had always feared, quote-unquote, two sudden reforms, and when universal suffrage was implemented, he saw it as the victory of the, quote-unquote, peaceful tactic. So, for the so-called democratized fatherland, behind whose right-wing government in 1914 he called, quote-unquote, the whole nation to rally and be loyal, he was ready to create a reformed army where sons of the working people would have to serve for a shorter time, so there would be enough funds left to pay for the sons of the upper class, the university educated, to be made into officers. This new army will put special emphasis on specialist forces, into which the funds saved by reducing the service time will be spent. The Social Democrat government hasn't even been able to dismantle the quote-unquote rank regiments, whose officer posts are reserved for the aristocracy, and the fascist officers have been able to work freely, forming armed security centers of the ruling classes against the workers. The big bourgeoisie of Sweden, with its aristocratic and large landowner branches, can look with understanding at Branting's quote-unquote youthful sins, which he has since settled. After all, the best fascists have typically gone through the schools of democracy and social democracy. One thing the ruling classes can't quite forgive Branting, though, that in 1909 he allowed a workers' mass strike to respond to the treacherous attack of the employers against the workers' right to organize. Albeit the workers lost because of Branting's half-heartedness, the strike remained as a spot on Branting's, in the eyes of the bourgeoisie, otherwise untarnished reputation. The bourgeoisie could not, while looking at his broad back, with which he was shielding them, as one eulogist so aptly put it, even imagine that he would have to at least sometimes bend under the weight of the masses, albeit only, quote-unquote, to salvage the situation for the exploiters. When, after his death, workers were being oppressed with a massive lockout, Branting's followers didn't make the same mistake again. They calmly rejected the demand of the working masses that in response to the lockout of the capitalists, there should be a mass strike. The peak of Branting's illusionist policy were his so-called peace speeches. They were an innocent exercise, since nobody truly threatened Sweden's neutrality at the time. It is a lot more interesting that he could still present himself as a politician of peace even after openly acting as an agent of the Entente and even the Tsar, all throughout the World War. The Versailles peace gave him an opportunity to gain quote-unquote respect from the Germans, because he spoke with indignation about the so-called one-sidedness of certain features of this violent peace. And when in the Council of the League of Nations he stood up to state his opinion about Mussolini's shameful actions on the Corfu issue, the representatives of the imperialist powers greeted him with a long applause because the diplomatic, quote-unquote, denunciation by such a, quote-unquote, righteous man fit so well with the outward decrees of this holy league. Pinelev has said of Branting that, quote, he could, on many difficult questions, work as an arbiter of agreement because everyone was convinced that he would find a solution in keeping with a humane spirit, unquote. The interests of imperialism need such a quote-unquote idealist to maintain the illusions of a quote-unquote League of Nations through which problems can supposedly be solved. Branting is especially respected as a so-called friend of small nations. 
The author of this text remembers how the stance of Finnish social democracy in favor of Finnish independence and against Kerensky's imperialism was a quote-unquote unpleasant surprise to the Dutch Scandinavian Committee in 1917. Husmans admitted it openly while Branting received with a sour smile the demand of the Finnish social democrats which perfectly matched the nation's right to self-determination and the social democratic quote-unquote ideology but which at the time didn't match his so-called idealist realism that Benesch has spoken about. To Finnish comrades, Branting states his doubts about such a quote-unquote far-reaching experiment as the internal autonomy which we demanded at the time. The thing is, he had just before tried to convince us that Finland should only try to regain its quote-unquote sworn rights, that is, some kind of appearance of autonomy that it had had under the Tsar. So the humble, so-called friend of small nations, was always a welcome guest to the feast tables of the imperialists. The proletarian revolution of Russia was for Branting a rock which caused a lot of difficulty, and the ship of his beautiful sounding but empty rhetoric would have been smashed against it if the working class of small Sweden had had the knowledge to be insulted that their trusted representative was stabbing another country's working class in the back. Though Pranting knew how to skillfully mask his opinions with words, he openly approved of the military intervention against Soviet Russia. Compared to that shamelessly counter-revolutionary act, it of course looks like a minor thing that his comrade in the same party, naval minister Palmstilna, the so-called proletarian baron, now the Swedish ambassador in London, allowed Swedish ships to escort along their shores those ships which carried weapons and jägers against the Finnish revolution led by Branting's so-called beloved comrades, the Finnish Social Democrats. Swedish officers and NCOs were generously given quote-unquote leave to go fight against them, and it was even allowed to transport weapons from Sweden against those comrades. Above, I have presented some features which made Branting so valuable for the imperialists and reaction on top of which, let us give the main feature that made his cynical treachery look like quote-unquote idealism and quote-unquote honesty in the eyes of the broad masses of the people. This feature was his complete lack of principle. Branting could, for example, write about Marx and Engels, describing them in the highest praise, only to say, like in his preface to Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Engels, that the foundation of their theory, the unsolvable antagonism of class contradictions, their theory of revolution, and theory about the state, are, quote-unquote, outdated. When writing about Lenin, he could lay flowers on Lenin's grave, admitting that Lenin had, better than the Mensheviks, understood the Russian people. And yet, Branting's friends, MacDonald and Benesch, could still say that Branting, quote-unquote, never gave up his principles. Which is true if we take into account that he had no principles. As Chamberlain put it, quote, he was an idealist who never lost his sense of realism. Unquote. That is, he was an idealist up there in the so-called realm of ideology, but in the real world he was a realist, or more accurately, an opportunist. By having such a dualist outlook, even the loftiest quote-unquote idealist can commit the lowest and vilest actions. It is worth noting that Branting never wrote a single theoretical presentation, only the most useful so-called praxis, combined with skillful yet empty rhetoric, made such a life possible. Renegade Herglund, who in 1920 wrote quite correctly in his pamphlet Branting as an Eater of Bolsheviks, that, quote, presenting counter-revolutionary politics as pure Marxism is possible only in a country of political illiteracy, unquote, praised this counter-revolutionary on his beer. Quite natural, he won't find peace in laurels of the deceased, the deceased in whose footsteps he has tried to follow, though without success. Note by the translator. Z. Herglund was a Swedish socialist who originally supported the October Revolution and was even elected to the Comintern Executive Committee. However, in 1924 he turned against the Comintern and joined the Swedish right-wing Social Democrats. Finland Eater, in Finnish Suomen Suoja, in Swedish Finland Zetare, was a satirical term used by Finns and Swedes to describe Russian imperialism which attacked Finland's autonomy and sovereignty, particularly during the Russification periods, 
1899-1905 and 1908-1917. In the pamphlet, the satirical term was turned on its head. Russia was no longer an imperialist but a Soviet republic, which was now being devoured by imperialists. Hence the pamphlet calls Branting an eater of Bolsheviks for supporting the imperialist invasion of Russia. End of note by the translator. Some have tried to defend Branting by saying that despite his bourgeois nature, he didn't go as far as his fellow party member Ebert. True, he wasn't as shameless as that, but even more disgusting was his diplomatic dishonesty. It is not our job to investigate whether in his social fascism he was a self-deceiver or an unknowing deceiver. We have to say what is true, and all the more boldly, the deeper the illusions of the masses are. In terms of facts, there is no difference between Swedish social democracy and German so-called Barmatism. Footnote by the translator. The Barmat scandal in 1924 and 1925 implicated the Social Democratic Party of Germany in corruption, war profiteering, fraud and bribery. End of note by the translator. The regular exposés about criminal deeds, frauds and embezzlements of funds prove that the degradation of Swedish social democracy has progressed equally far. That Branting successors would ruthlessly shoot at workers, if put in the same situation as Noske in Germany, is doubted by nobody. Branting was one of the pillars of the Second International. He had broader possibilities than others to lead the workers down a false path, and he did so successfully. His supporters can continue for a long time deceiving the workers due to his authority. Swedish papers are already suggesting that his image would be put on a so-called Statue of Peace to be erected in Stockholm, alongside images of Karl Liebknecht, Georges and Lenin. We will see if Branting's supporters have the audacity to put their images side by side, after Branting said that in Lenin and MacDonald, Branting's trusted friend in treachery are as opposed as fire and water. Hopefully our comrades, communists in Sweden, know how to prevent such an obscenity. Signed, Uryo Sirola, Leningrad, March 11, 1925.